citizen has the right to a vigorous defense. That, of course, includes one of the most infamous suspects currently under arrest, the man accused of stabbing four University of Idaho students to death as they slept after a night of partying. Those students were best friends Kaylee Gonzalez and Madison Mogan, Zana Kernodal and her boyfriend Ethan Chapin. Given the DNA and other evidence against their suspected killer, the police have released through the probable cause affidavit in this case. Many are wondering what could possibly be done to defend against all that. Today, I'm putting that question to local defense attorney Mark Reichel. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Sincerely. Very nice to be here. So the investigators in Moscow, Idaho, have shared that the DNA of their suspect, Brian Koberger, was found on a knife sheath left behind by the killer of these four students right next to one of the bodies. All four were stabbed. This seems pretty damning. How might you explain away your DNA being found at this murder scene at the home of people you don't know in any conventional way? Well, they're, they're going to have to have more. Believe it or not, the development of DNA science and research can also be helpful for the defense in cases like this. Transferable DNA, transference DNA is now something that often actually helps to the search for the truth that can help a defendant, in, like in this case, actually. Uh, smaller and smaller and smaller samples of DNA can be evaluated and give us information. Transferable DNA is so transferable. This individual could have been at a restaurant, could have been somewhere else where one of these victims touch something or some, uh, someone near the victim touched it, that victim touched something that that person touched. So the DNA in, is, itself is not going to be enough, actually. There's other issues that I think are going to be really important to the case. Okay, but we're going to talk a little bit more about DNA. The positive DNA match came from genetic genealogy typing made possible after officers went through trash. They say that Cobra actually deposited in his neighbor's trash bin in Pennsylvania. You don't have any expectation of privacy for something you're tossing away, right? So are That's there correct. other grounds to maybe get that trash evidence which led to this match thrown out? No, that's going to be, you know, look, I've, I've been in the U.S. Supreme Court arguing on search and seizure in the Fourth Amendment. I'm a, a firm believer, and that's the first line of defense is attack the search. I don't think that's possible. When you put things in the trash, you've given away your expectation of privacy. Someone who's just going through trash can take it. It's theirs. You've abandoned it. So that's not going to be the effective attack in this case, in my opinion. Okay. Now, police have not really explained or commented about how their suspect may have known these victims. Is that a point that you as a defense attorney could spin in your client's favor? He had maybe no reason to go after these people in this very personal fashion. Stabbing is always kind of described as something like this being very personal, that he didn't even know that. Maybe, I don't know, you mentioned like transfer DNA from a restaurant. Two of these young ladies worked at a very popular restaurant, so maybe the defense checks his bank records to be able to say he's never been, you know, to a place where they worked or known to be. So this is not him. Sincerely, I'll just tell you, you're as good as any defense attorney I've ever met, and I've been doing this <laughs> for over 30 years. So uh, those are excellent points. I think what the defense is going to do is try to push a little bit back on the DNA and say, look, because of transference, this doesn't mean he was there holding that knife that night, and they can absolutely prove that with science. Number two, if they can really cut away against this eyewitness who says she watched him walk by through the house and put some doubt there, then if I was the defense attorney, I'd say every one of us knows that motive is the most important and powerful tool. And where was the motive in this case? Where is the motive in this case? And if they don't have some type of a motive, Motive is not a required element, mm -hmm. but we're human beings. We rationally think things through. The defense is going to say, this is something that's personal, and they have no motive. So those are some of the things you've identified the defense is going to do. Okay. The probable cause affidavit, the PCA, says that pings through Brian Koberger's phone put him in the area of the King Road home where the killings happened 12 times. One of those times about five, five and a half hours after the alleged time of the murders. So the theory would be that he returned to the scene of the crime, kind of how arsonists are often spotted in the crowd watching a building burn. How do you defend against that 12 times? I get you on that, but if I was the defense, there's something I would do. Show how many other cars went by, how many other people went by. And if you can come up with 100, well, then you say, well, there's your reasonable doubt. But more importantly, sincerely, I think the fact that he blocked his phone, he stopped from transmitting from 2.20 in the morning until 4 
4 mm-hmm. 50 in the morning or something along those lines he took the he took effort to block his phone from pinging for roughly two hours the time of the murders if i'm the prosecution that's what i'm going to zero in on this is a real intentional act to go to your phone make sure it's not sending out any signals and then do that for two hours that's something i think is kind of powerful i would be afraid of if i was the defense attorney in the case Okay, the public defender in this case has asked for her client's preliminary hearing to be pushed all the way until June. Usually, it's within two weeks of arrest. Is this a choice that you would have made pushing the preliminary hearing so far out? Uh, Yeah, I think that, you know, look, it's a lot to go through. You get it once, you do it right. So if you can use that preliminary hearing to gain all sorts of ideas about what the trial will be like for the prosecution, then you want to do your prelim well. You don't want to prepare for trial and then say, boy, I wish I would have looked into this at the prelim and known the answer. Trial by ambush is the last thing you want. So I can see why they wanted more time for the prelim. It's risky Mm -hmm. to rush a prelim when you're the defense. All righty. And just lastly, when it comes to trial, we often hear about proceedings being moved due to pretrial publicity. This case obviously went international long before there was an arrest. Where can the suspect get a fair trial? Definitely not locally in Idaho, but you know, um, you can find places where they haven't really followed it much. Usually your bigger urban areas and it'll be somewhere else in Idaho, which is going to be difficult to find. Okay. Because this is not a state that's, you know, got these rich urban populations where people read the newspaper, not for the local events. All righty. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. It is going to be a case that the whole country, the whole world is going to be talking about as it moves forward. And right now, as I mentioned earlier, it seems like a lot of the evidence that's been released to the public, very damning. But we know defense attorneys like yourself do have to do their due diligence. Thank you so much. Thank you.